This recorded lecture will cover chapter seven, skin and membranes in the human body in health and disease textbook. In a previous lecture, I mentioned that the integumentary system is made up of one organ and that organ is the skin. And then it has several different appendages that are associated with it. Something interesting uh, about the skin is that our skin regenerates itself completely in 28 days. There are two types of membranes that we're gonna talk about, or two classifications. The first one being epithelial membranes and the second being um, connective. So when we talk about epithelial membranes, we break those down further into three categories, which are cutaneous membranes, serous membranes, and mucous membranes. So let's talk about cutaneous membranes first. The cutaneous membrane is referring to the skin. And as we said before, the skin is the largest and most visible organ of the body, and it accounts for about 16% of the body weight. It also accounts for 16 tons of the total dust on earth. It is uh, responsible for shedding about 30 to 40,000 dead skin cells per minute, which is approximately nine pounds in one year. Also, there are millions of bacteria that live in us and on us and on our skin or our cutaneous membrane, there are approximately 50 million bacteria in one square inch. Now, serous membranes. Serous membranes are membranes that are found on surfaces within closed cavities, and they are typically a thin sheet of epithelial cells that are simple squamous. So, like I said, these line cavities, and they also cover the organs that live within those cavities. When we talk about the serous membranes that line the walls of body cavities, we refer to them as parietal. Parietal serous membranes, some good examples of those would be um, the parietal pleura that lines the thoracic cavity and the parietal perine uh, peritoneum that lines the abdominal cavity and the parietal pericardial tissue that lines the um, cavity uh, where the heart lies in the mediastinum. Now, visceral serous membranes cover the organs that are found in those cavities. So a good example would be the visceral membrane that covers the lungs or that covers all of the internal organs of the abdomen or that surrounds the heart itself. All right. So those are some examples. And when these tissues become inflamed, what happens is fluid can move out, more fluid can move out into the surrounding areas. A good example would be pleurisy or pleuritis. Um, this is characterized by um, inflammation of the, ser of the serous membrane or the pleura that lines the chest cavity. And another good example would be peritonitis or pericarditis. Now, mucous membranes, we already said that mucous membranes have these specialized little cells that are inserted within them called goblet cells, and these goblet cells produce mucus, all right? Mucous membranes are also epithelial membranes, and they contain both an epithelial layer and a fibrous or connective tissue layer. These membranes line body surfaces that open directly to the exterior of the body. So an example would be the vagina, the mouth, the nose, and the anus. They also line the uh, urinary tract as well. Uh, in most cases, the cell composition is either stratified squamous or simple columnar. It could also be pseudostratified epithelia. 
Now, collective tissue membranes, they're different from the membranes that we just talked about, like cutaneous, serous, and mucus, because they do not contain epithelial components. A good example of a connective tissue membrane is a synovial membrane. Now, synovial membranes line synovial joints, big joints like the hip and the knee, and also smaller joints like the ankle and the wrist. Now, these membranes, their job is to secrete kind of like an oil for our joints so that they stay lubricated and they can move easily. Synovial fluid is very slippery, um, and uh, when you do total joint replacements or total hips, total knees, that fluid leaks out and it makes all of your instrumentation and components that you're handling very slippery. So we typically keep like a moistened sponge, a lap sponge, so that as things come back to us, we can wipe them off and um, so that we don't risk dropping them. I've definitely had that happen to me before. Now these synovial membranes, they line these small little cushions in the joint called bursa. And these bursa are typically found between um, body parts that move. And when we are talking about body parts that move, we're specifically talking about bones. The skin is composed of two primary layers, and we refer to them as the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, and the dermis, which is uh, deep to the epidermis, so it lies underneath the epidermis. Now, the epidermis has a few different layers, and the innermost one is called the stratum germinativum. Now, this layer is the deepest layer, and this is where new cells are born. New cells are born here, and, and I remember this by thinking of the word germinate. I, I know that that word means to grow or to sprout, so I kind of connect those two things together. So this is where those um, epithelial cells undergo mitosis, and then they start the journey from that uh, innermost layer up to the surface, all right? Um, sometimes this is also referred to as the pigment layer because this is also where the melanocytes live. And the melanocytes are re um, responsible for giving the color or the pigment to our skin. Now, as cells approach the surface, as they're working their way up towards the stratum corneum, the stratum corneum, which is that outer layer, um, they... Uh, are filled with a tough waterproof protein, and this protein is called keratin. Now, once they make their way all the way to the surface, they eventually die and flake off and make up that nine pounds of dead skin that we shed each year. So let's take a closer look at the two different layers of the skin. Down here, we have the dermis, and I'm just gonna trace where dermis and epidermis meet right here. So below the purple line is dermis, above the purple line is epidermis, and this stratum basal here is what the book refers to as the stratum germinativum. This is where the new cells are born, and they migrate their way all the way up to the top, and when they get to the top, to the stratum corneum, they are dead and keratinized, and then they flake off, and this process just continues over and over. Sometimes the epidermis will appear different in color, and there's a couple reasons why. The first one, it could be uh, that it's looking more pink or more red, and this could indicate that there's increased blood flow to that area. And uh, this becomes important when, let's say, somebody comes in and they have a severed artery or they have a finger that's been cut off and we have to reestablish that blood flow. So we're going to reestablish the blood flow by connecting the two ends of that vessel back together 
And then we're going to look at the fingertip, let's say, to see if there's what we call capillary refill. So we'll push on the nail and it'll kind of blanch, it'll get white, and then we'll let up and see if it turns pink or red. If it does, then that gives us the indication that there is good perfusion there and hopefully the finger will survive. Cyanosis is the opposite of that. Cyanosis, and you can see in this top picture here, this hand that it looks kind of grayish, purplish blue on the tips of the fingers. This is an indication that there is a decreased blood flow there. There's decreased perfusion. So the tips of the fingers aren't being oxygenated uh, properly. Something else that we might see is in this other picture here, this gentleman's face is vitiligo. Vitiligo results from um, a lack of melanocytes in that area of the skin. Um, also, there can be increased pigmentation by various hormone changes. Exposure to UV light can also cause uh, the melanocytes to darken and can also cause um, what's called sunspots. Um, and then in addition to that, there could be freckles and freckles are just small little flat macules and they're uh, a common normal skin pig, uh, pigmentation variation. Um, however, uh, if those freckles start to change or raise or something like that, then that could be a sign of some sort of malignancy and, you know, you, we would want to get that checked out as soon as possible. So a couple slides ago when we were looking at the microscopic view of the skin and I kind of outlined that distinction between epidermis and dermis, this is called the dermal epidermal junction. And this is a special area where those two meet. Remember, epidermis doesn't have any nerves or blood supply. So those um, vessels and nerves run right underneath the epidermis and right at the top of the dermis. There's these specialized little welds there that hold the two together at what I refer to as a subcuticular layer. And that subcuticular layer um, can be compromised if you've ever uh, gone on a long hike or something like that, you've been walking a lot and you developed a blister on your foot or your toe or something like that, this could be a sign that those spot welds have been uh, compromised. And uh, of course, inflammation happens there. Fluid runs out uh, between the tissues um, and with that normal inflammatory process like we've talked about before. And this is what can cause a blister. All right, we talked about the epidermis, and now we're gonna talk about the dermis. If you remember from the slide that we just looked at that epidermal-dermal junction, the dermis has these little bumps or peg-like projections, and those are referred to as dermal papillae. This is within the uppermost area of the dermis and is referred to as the papillary layer. All right, this is what helps those two, uh, where the epidermis and the der dermis come together to bind and fuse together. Now on the palms and the soles of the feet, that is where we find the thicker skin. It has these ridges and is usually devoid of hair. And then um, uh, predominantly the rest of the skin is referred to as thin skin. And this thin skin typically has hair and has irregular shallow grooves. Now let's go back and talk about those dermal ridges. The dermal ridges are what make up our fingerprints, that unique pattern that uh, everybody has on their hands. Now some people, um, due to a genetic mutation, never develop fingerprints. This is called dermatopathia pigmentosa. Now the um, deeper area of the dermis is filled with a network of really tough, collagenous, stretchy, elastic fibers 
um, within the what we refer to as the reticular layer or that fibrous layer. This is what makes the skin really stretchable and elastic, and in some places it's more stretchy and elastic than others. And a good example of this is the abdomen. The tissue of the abdomen is a lot more stretchy that, um, and uh, this is good because when the female gets pregnant, the skin is gonna need to stretch to accommodate the growing fetus. And sometimes afterwards or during, the uh, female will develop something called striae or stretch marks. And even though they might fade over time, they typically never completely disappear. Um, and as we go through that aging process, the collagen and elastin that lives in our skin um, uh, begins to uh, decrease. The, the, the elasticity of it begins to de decrease. So um, that means that it's not going to bounce back as easily or wrinkles could develop. And then the last thing I want to mention is that within the dermis, there are a bunch of different structures that are embedded within it, uh, and those include muscle fibers, hair follicles, sweat and sebaceous glands, and also blood vessels. Here are some images of some of the things I mentioned on the previous slide, the top picture being striae or stretch marks and then the middle one um, just representing that as our skin ages it loses coll collagen and elastin um, and that can cause wrinkles and then you can see some different spots some different birthmarks and um, stork bites here below. Aside from the palms of the hand the soles of the feet and the lips Every square inch of the human body is covered with hair. The hair follicle is located deep within the dermal layer of the skin, and this is uh, formed by epidermal cells that grow down into the dermis, and they form this little tube. Uh, the base of the tube is called the root, and in the root, there is something called a hair papilla. And the hair papilla is nourished by a, a capillary uh, and a vein, venule. And this hair papilla is covered with cells that are similar to the cells in the stratum germinativum. So similar thing happens here as a hair grows, as does new cells uh, skin cells that are born in the stratum germinativum and push their way forward towards the surface. By the time those cells uh, start to build up in the hair follicle, they keratinize and die and they become the hair that you see that protrudes from the skin. When we're talking about hair loss, the medical term for that is alopecia, and there are several different types. Alopecia errata could be just a small little um, area without hair. Other situations that can cause hair loss uh, include infections, chemo and radiation. Stress can also cause hair loss. During uh, the months following childbirth, females can also have something called postpartum alopecia, which typically the hair replaces itself within about a year, maybe a little less. Sometimes we see individuals that have um, complete baldness and they're young people and it's not due to um, aging or anything like that, and we call this alopecia totalis. So the last thing that we're gonna talk about um, in regards to the hair is a little specialized structure called the erector pili. And the erector pili is a tiny little muscle, and I'm going to circ circle it for you. You can see it on the slide right here, right? And you can see that um, it's attached to the base of the epidermis, and it's attached to the uh, near the roots of the hair. Now, anytime you ever get goosebumps, it's because of your erector pili muscles. These little guys 
pull the hair to attention or cause the hair to stand up and that's what causes the little raised area on our skin that we refer to as goosebumps or goose pimples. Next, we're gonna talk about the nail. Now the nail is considered a accessory organ of the skin and the nail is also produced by cells in the epidermis. And these epidermal cells um, keratinize and then they become hard and plate-like and that becomes our nail. So there's some different structures, uh, some anatomy to the nail and uh, I'm gonna circle them for you. This first one right here is the, um, the nail plate or the nail body, all right? And the nail body is um, the visible part of the nail, okay? And then the rest of the nail is hidden under the cuticle and that is the root, the nail root. So here you can see the cuticle, uh, right here and then that root of the nail is hidden underneath the cuticle there uh, you can also see this little moon shaped area that's called the lunula and the lunula means little moon and it's just this crescent little white crescent um, area that can be seen now a lot of times we'll look at the nail beds, like I mentioned before, to see what color they are. The um, nail bed is highly vascularized. So if it's really pink, then that means we're getting good perfusion to the extremities and that's a good sign. However, if they're dusky or kind of grayish or blue, that could mean that there isn't good perfusion and the, the tips of fingers and toes aren't getting the oxygen that they need. This can also, uh, changes in nails can also be a sign of some sort of underlying condition or disease. Um, it could be a sign of a uh, various congenital syndromes as well as tumors, could also be a sign of peripheral vascular disease. Now, sometimes the um, nail will come separated from the nail bed and uh, that is called onycholysis. And it's a common thing that can occur, and typically the uh, nail will grow out and uh, it will look normal. However, if the cuticle, uh, or the root rather, is damaged, then this could cause damage to the, to the nail. Well, sometimes in surgery, we bring individuals in that have chronic ingrown toenails and we remove those toenails and we actually uh, use a, an acid type substance to kill the nerve root so that those nails do not grow back. Uh, and then lastly, pitting can be a sign of uh, psoriasis. The skin contains several structures that we refer to as receptors, and these receptors are responsible for helping us sense our environment. Each receptor is designed to sense a specific type of sensory input. Some may sense heat while others sense cold. Some may sense stretch or pressure or vibration, and others still may sense pain. Now the book talks about two different types of receptors, the Meisner corpuscle and the Pacini corpuscle. Now the Meisner corpuscle is responsible for detecting light pressure or light touch, and that makes sense because it just lies right underneath the epidermal layer. Now the Pacini corpuscle is responsible for sensing deeper pressure and that makes sense because it lies deeper within the dermal layer. So where would you say on the human body uh, where there's a heightened sensitivity? Research suggests that areas like the tongue, the lips, the palms, the fingertips, the clitoris, the penis, and the nipples are the most sensitive areas on the human body. These areas respond very quickly to slight pressure or just 20 milligrams of pressure. This is compared to the weight of a housefly. 
Now we're going to talk about the different glands that are associated with the skin. And there's two different types. There's sweat glands or sudoriferous glands, and there are the oil glands, which are the sebaceous glands. Now there's two types of sweat glands, acrine glands and apocrine glands. Now the acrine glands, those are the ones that are the most numerous, and those are the ones that are responsible for keeping us cool or regulating our body heat. Um, when we say that we're sweating, it's because uh, typically because of the eccrine glands. Now, on the palms of the hand, they're more highly concentrated, approximately 300 sweat glands per square inch of skin on the palms. Now, if you look really closely at your skin, you might see these little tiny holes that we call pores. Well, this is where um, the, the uh, small ducts of the um, sweat glands exit the skin, um, and uh, that's how the sweat gets out. So the other type of sweat gland or sudoriferous gland is called apocrine uh, sweat glands. And they're primarily found in the axilla, uh, in the genital area, and uh, around the anus. They're larger than the eccrine glands, and instead of a more watery substance, they secrete a thicker, more milky substance. Now, the smell doesn't, the odor of the apocrine glands doesn't come from the secretion itself. It actually comes from the breakdown of that secretion by the bacteria that typically live on our skin. So lastly, let's cover sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands or oil glands are located at the base of hair follicles. And these um, sebaceous glands are responsible for lubricating, um, uh, for secreting sebum, and sebum um, lubricates and softens the hair. Right now, the, uh, the activity of sebaceous glands is regulated by the sex hormones, and as um, puberty approaches, sex hormones increase, and that increases the release of sebaceous glands, and this can result in blackheads or pimples uh, in the teenager. That is um, pretty common. Um, Severe types of acne, uh, uh, the most common kind we refer to as acne vulgaris, which is inflammation of the sebaceous gland ducts, and it most frequently occurs during adolescence. Now, um, sometimes blockage of the sebaceous uh, ducts can occur, and this uh, the bacteria and skin cells and sebum get trapped in there, and uh, once that happens, this kind of inflamed area or lesion develops, and we refer to that as a papule. Uh, other times, there are more pus-filled pimples, and we refer to them as pustules. And uh, when pustules rupture, they typically cause secondary infection on the surrounding skin. Uh, so, you know, typically uh, acne is treated by cleansing. Um, sometimes um, they might, if, if it's too severe, individuals might have to take some sort of oral antibiotic. Um, so these pictures here that you can see, this is actually called um, hydranitis, and hydranitis is um, the blockage of sweat glands, and you can see here in the axilla, and then underneath the breasts and the abdomen, and then the last picture, um, this is actually a sebaceous cyst here. Um, so we um, do hydradenectomies in the operating room where we will remove these lesioned areas or this um, these inflamed um, sweat glands, or like you see below, um, we also, uh, if the situation is too severe to be corrected in the office, then they'll bring them into the operating room and we will remove the area um, and remove that sebaceous cyst. So functions of the skin are um, listed on this slide here. And I've also um, 
put this little image about some amazing facts about your skin, some which I might have already mentioned before, but let's talk about some functions of the skin. Remember that we said um, in the organ systems lecture that the job of the skin is to provide our first line of defense. So it's one of its big jobs is to protect us and the underlying structures, the deeper tissues of our bodies and our organs, it's to protect them from outside envi environment or invaders. So it protects the, the insides from the outside. So that's one of its first jobs. Another job that we've talked about briefly is temperature regulation. And we have already said that this is the job of the eccrine glands um, to secrete sweat. And as that sweat evaporates, that helps to cool our body. Uh, another thing that it does is regulate blood flow um, and uh, body surface. So um, if we are cold, then blood is going to typically kind of um, hang out closer to the core of the body, or if we're warm, then um, vessels are going to dilate and um, it, so it also helps to control uh, heat regulation that way. Um, another job of the skin is uh, sensation. And we talked about the re receptors that are located there. We specifically talked about the, the Meisner's corpuscle and the Pacinian corpuscle and how they sense pressure. But there's other receptors as well that sense heat and cold and pain and vibration. Uh, excretion, we talked about the skin excretes sweat. Uh, it also secretes other various waste products from the skin. And lastly, synthesis of vitamin D. So when we are exposed to the sun, that stimulates our skin to um, make vitamin D, All right? So we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about skin grafts. So there's two different types of skin grafts that I've mentioned before, split thickness skin graft and full thickness skin graft. So split thickness skin grafts consist of all of the epidermis and a portion of the dermis. And the surgeon is going to decide how deep to take that graft. Split thickness skin grafts are best used to cover uh, bigger areas uh, that require grafting or a recipient site that requires a larger um, donor skin. So uh, you can see uh, this picture right here that I'm going to put a little purple X on is um, the surgeon is using this device called a dermatome. And you can see, I'm going to put a green X on the dermatome over here on this right slide. You can see the actual device that's going to be used to harvest the graft. This is a disposable blade right here that I'm circling. So this disposable blade is going to fit onto the dermatome. Now this dermatome can either be electric or it can be air powered. And once that blade fits on there, this little screwdriver right here is going to be used to tighten down that blade on these two screws after the surgeon picks one of these plates right here. So uh, you can see the space here, here, they have different sizes. So this is going to determine the width of the graft. So the surgeon will identify which plate they want. Um, and then as the surge check, we're gonna load the blade. We're gonna put the plate on top of that. You can see that this would go over those little screw holes and then snug it down with the screwdriver, all right? Once we are ready to take the skin graft, then uh, the surgeon is going to want to apply some sort of lubricating substance to the skin. And typically, we use mineral oil. So apply mineral oil to the skin. And a good place to take split thickness skin graft is the front or the back of the thigh, the abdomen, or the lower back as well. And they'll go ahead and harvest the graft. And then lastly, down here, I'm going to put a little red X on this last part right here. Um, 
I don't know if you can see this little plastic card right here that the skin is actually on, right? Um, this is called a carrier, and the carrier has these little lines in it. And it's um, going to start, uh, the surgeon's going to put the skin on the little plastic card, and the card is actually going to start on the other side. Here it's coming out already um, in this mesh-like pattern, but it's going to start on the other side. This is called the mesher, and it has a little handle right here that you kind of ratchet back and forth, and it's going to push that card with the skin on it through this meshing device and uh, this serves to increase the surface area so we get more bang for our buck and I, uh, as I mentioned before it also helps to eliminate uh, or greatly reduce the serosanguinous fluid that could potentially be trapped underneath the graft if there wasn't um, these little holes so that that fluid could exit. So what we're, we're hoping for is that the tissue of the patient uh, where the wound is, is going to grow into those little um, mesh-like holes uh, of the graft, okay, and um, incorporate itself with the um, the area where we're covering the wound. Um, so that's a split thickness skin graft. Now this picture right here that's in the middle is a full thickness skin graft. And a full thickness skin graft incorporates the epidermis, all of the dermis, and some of the underlying fat tissue or adipose tissue. And these are good for covering small defects like you can see on this individual here, perhaps a melanoma or something. Um, and these grafts can be harvested from various places, uh, typical, typically common places right in front of the ear uh, if they're going to do um, some sort of grafting and, and not some sort of rotation flap. So that is skin grafting. Before we go on and talk about skin lesions, I, uh, when we were talking about skin grafts, I just wanted to mention some interesting statistics. Um, the first one is, is that um, four acres, four acres, that's a lot of skin, can be grown in a lab from one square inch of foreskin. Another interesting fact is that scientists uh, uh, in the lab are now able to grow artificial skin, and they grow that using a combination of silicone and collagen that comes from cows. Okay, so uh, here on this slide, you see a variety of different uh, skin lesions. You can kind of look at those and get an understanding um, of what each one of those represents. We're not going to spend too much time on that. Next, we're going to talk about burns. So the severity of burns are determined by three major factors. And the first factor is the depth and the number of tissue layers involved. Second is how much surface area of the body is affected. And thirdly, the type of homeostatic mechanisms that are damaged or destroyed, whether it's um, respiratory or blood pressure control or fluid and electrolyte balance. So we mentioned that the skin is our first line of defense. So when we have a burn, we've already started to strip away our body's defenses. Now, when we classify burns, we classify them as first, second, third, or fourth degree burns. And you can see these images here that are clearly labeled what is what. First degree burns are considered partial thickness burns. This means that only the surface layers of the epidermis are involved. Second degree burns are a little bit deeper and involve uh, deep epidermal layers and they always cause injury to the upper layers of the dermis. So now all epidermis and, now, and into the dermis. Third degree burns are referred to as 
full thickness burns, and they're characterized by complete destruction of all of the epidermis and all of the dermis. They might actually involve the underlying muscle uh, and bone, and if this is the case, that's referred to as a fourth degree burn. Now, when we have individuals that have significant burns over a significant area of their body, they're um, hugely susceptible to infections, to water loss. Um, you know, their body doesn't have this mechanism, this first line of defense, so um, they're going to be severely compromised. So um, if uh, any of you were uh, living in Arizona uh, in 2001, you might have heard of this on the news where this officer um, was out to help. Uh, he was on the side of the road. He actually, um, his car was hit from behind, it was a Crown Vic, and it exploded. And so the news reporters said that 40% of his body was burned. Well, how do we figure that out? The way that we figure that out is by something called the rule of nines. And the rule of nines breaks down the body into percentages of surface area. So here you can see that the front of the abdomen is 18% uh, and the back would be 18% as well. The front of each arm would be 4.5 and the back of each arm would be 4.5. The front of the head or the face would be 4.5 and the back of the head would be 4.5% as well. Each leg would be 9% uh, on the front of each leg and 9% on the back of each leg. However, if it was just um, the thigh or just the front of the leg below the knee, then that would constitute 4.5%. So this is how they come up with an estimate of how much body surface uh, is burned. Here we're looking at some terminology uh, regarding skin infections, and then we'll look at some pictures on the next slide. So the first one is impetigo. Impetigo is a highly contagious staphylococcal or streptococcal infection. Um, and then tinea is a fungal infection or a mycosis of the skin. Uh, wart is a benign neoplasm caused by the papilloma virus. There are several different strains of papilloma. Boils are referred to as furuncles, and they are also caused by our friend Staphylococcus, uh, which gets into the hair follicles and infects them. And lastly, scabies, which is a parasitic infection. So let's look at some pictures of that. Here in this top left picture, you can see uh, this is impetigo, and then below that on the left, this is a furuncle. Uh, top right would be uh, uh, tinea or tinea, and we also refer to that as ringworm. And then the bottom right here uh, is scabies. Other types of vascular and inflammatory skin disorders uh, are decubitus ulcers or bed sores. And these develop when these bony prominences uh, are laid on for too long. And little old frail people that really don't have a lot of adipose anymore when they're laying in bed for a long time, they can get these pressure sores or bed sores. Um, uh, urticaria or hives is an inflammatory reaction. So um, this could be some sort of allergy and uh, it results in red lesions. And then scleroderma is a disorder of the vessels in the connective tissue, and this is characterized by hardening of the skin. And there's two different types, localized uh, and then systemic, which would be um, all over the entire body. So we'll look at some images of that coming up on the next slide. Here we're looking at a decubitus ulcer. Uh, in the top left, you can see that that is like, around the coccyx area. And uh, 
a lot of times we get these individuals into the operating room to do something called a debridement. And a debridement means we're going to remove all of that devitalized or dead tissue, that rotting tissue. And then um, this amazing uh, wound care invention that they have come up with is something called the wound vac. And um, I'm sure there's several different manufacturers of it. This is just one example. But you can see on the top right how there's like this foam looking substance um, on this person's leg. Um, so anywhere that there was a, an open wound or let's say this decubitus ulcer, um, uh, they're going to open up onto the field these pieces of foam. And the surgeon's going to cut the foam to kind of fit into that open wound. And then there's like this sticky kind of adhesive saran wrap that's going to get stuck uh, down. It's going to stick to the foam and to the skin, and it's going to create a seal so that this vacuum will work. And uh, then the surgeon's going to cut a small little slit and insert this um, little vacuum hose. Another little sticky saran wrap is going to go over that to seal it all up. Now, once it gets hooked to this machine, it's going to keep constant suction on the wound. And this is good because it is going to keep the wound dry, and it's also going to tease those edges together. It's going to kind of keep pulling on that tissue, and it's going to encourage uh, what we call uh, healing by second intention or granulation. So um, sometimes the patients will come back several times to have the wound cleaned, uh, you know, into the OR, we'll clean the wound, we'll do some more debridement, we will put fresh sponges, and um, this is like an amazing uh, tool that uh, wound care uh, professionals uh, can now use to help uh, heal these uh, wounds like decubitus ulcer and whatnot. While there are several types of skin cancer, for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to cover three different types. And those types are squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Now, UV radiation is the most common causal factor of these three types of skin cancers. And what UV radiation does is it damages the DNA that's in the nucleus of the cell. And when the cell goes to replicate, it produces an anaplastic cell that is an abnormal type cell. And this is what leads to a, a cancerous uh, lesion. So the first type, squamous cell carcinoma, is a, a very slow growing malignant tumor and it arises from the epidermis. It typically looks hardened and raised and if not treated, squamous cell carcinoma uh, can metastasize and invade other organs. Basal cell carcinoma, however, is much less likely to metastasize. It is typically found in the upper areas of the face, and it arises from the base layer of the epidermis, that stratum germin germinativum. And then lastly, melanoma. Melanoma is the most serious form of skin cancer. Um, and unfortunately, in the United States, the occurrence of melanoma is increasing, and it is quite high here in the sunny state of Arizona as well. Um, and unfortunately, it causes death in about every one uh, in four cases. Last on our list of things to talk about is Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma or Kaposi's syndrome um, is characterized by lesions that grow in areas like the respiratory tract and the digestive tract. Um, it's also known as a, a, a human herpes virus um, or HHV8. And it's associated mainly with certain ethnic groups and it is also fairly common in AIDS patients or other individuals that have various immune deficiencies. Um, it typically first um, presents itself as little purple papules, and in this uh, image here, A, you can see that uh, arrow pointing to 
that little kind of raised purplish area um, is a, the beginning of a Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, we do see these in surgery sometimes where um, they have developed in the esophagus or the intestinal tract and they're actually blocking the passage of, of contents of that tract. So um, the patient may need to have a bowel resection or some sort of colostomy um, to, to remove these lesions. So this brings us to the end of our review of chapter seven and skin and membranes. Uh, remember to identify your muddy points and be ready to talk about those in class. And I look forward to um, seeing you then.